Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the kind introduction. I hope it's okay for you to do it without a microphone, but I think the room is small enough. So, um, I am, my name is Matthias Thiel. I, I come from Saarbrücken um, in Germany, and I'm a PhD student at the uh, Institute for Experiment, Experiments and Methods. And our main focus is to um, develop new experiments and new methods to describe fatigue behavior. And today I will um, present some results on how we can use these methods, methods to describe variable amplitude fatigue. Um, if someone speaks of variable amplitude fatigue, you usually start with the overload effect. I think the overload effect was now mentioned several times in this conference. But why is it so interesting? Well, the main problem with fatigue behavior is that we usually don't use a physical equation, which is just using an empirical equation with, which is based on the principle of similitude. So we have an external microscopic delta k and try to link this <coughs> with a microscopic scale, which is the crack row rate. Um, and uh, this works quite well if you have a usual crack and you fatigue it under constant amplitude. Then you even have your region, your Paris region, where you can describe it with the Paris law and even give lifetime predictions. The problem is if you have one increased cycle, then the crack begins to decelerate. And the deceleration um, is something like a low history dependent memory. And this similarity to behavior, the same data k leads to the same fatigue factor rate. Now it obviously does not count anymore. And there were the question what about lifetime predictions? Um, now, the nice thing on the overload effect is that when you increase the overload, then you, uh, the, uh, usually the crank becomes uh, slower, so it's somewhat consistent. Um, the, this mechanism is mainly driven by the residual stress, so in order to investigate, it's quite interesting to have a look at the residual stress. Um, and that's what we did. We took several cracks, fatigued them under constant amplitude to a certain fatigue crack length, and apply different overload levels to them and measure the residual stress with magnetic Barkhausen noise. And before you open the overload, you see already a compressive residual stress field around the crack, uh, which is originated in the site of Bell plus the flow. After the overload, this compressive residual stress begins to evolve, especially in front of the crack, and uh, they increase both in, in size as in as an amplitude, um, which can be linked to, to, this, to this maximum deceleration, uh, which is already one of the parameters that describes the overload behavior. We have maximum retardation, so which is the, the, the ratio of the crack cross speed the crack would have had if it didn't have an overload to the, um, to the crack cross speed the crack has because of the overload. Uh, other parameters to describe crack cross behavior are the number of delay cycles, which can be seen here. So the crack stands nearly stands still for several thousand of cycles, and uh, then the delay length, which can, which can be somehow correlated with the uh, plastic zone, because this is the reason for the crack to decelerate. Um, now, at this point, I, since I'm a material scientist, I was asking myself, which role plays the material in all, in all this? And if you compare this work with the nice talk of Professor Bongi um, in this morning, you see that her course were quantitatively the same, but she did use another material. And quantitatively, there were uh, not so many delay cycles that uh, um, have been with this material. And if you look at the literature, you see there are materials with a strong sensitivity to the overload behavior, and there are materials with a not so strong sensitivity um, of the overload behavior. And the reason for this can be found in the hardened behavior of material. And um, the literature has an opinion to this hardened behavior as well. Um, and again, you have to look at the plastic zone. Um, if you have a strain hardening, then the material in front of the crack becomes to, it's harder for the crack to deform this material. So, um, simulation so that if this material is hardened, the plastic zone begins to rotate uh, to, to uh, behind and the stress begins to concentrate in, the, in this plastic zone, which increases the plasticity induced crack closure. And thereby you have incrementally corrective shielding. Um, then you have a second effect, which is the Gaussian effect, which is also somehow a hardening effect which is driven by a back stress of micro-residual stresses. Now, if you think of micro-residual stresses and think they increase, that sounds good. But the problem is that these inhomogeneous micro-residual stresses prevent large micro-residual stresses to evolve. Because if um, the flow stress, the compressed flow stress, is, uh, is, over, is, uh, is overcome, the material begins to, to flow back, and you have reduced micro-residual stress that you can reach. And thereby, the plasticity induced crack closure is reduced because plasticity induced crack closure is a relaxation effect of the micro residual stresses when the brain grows into the material. Now, if you want to characterize this experimentally, what do you need? You need to know the behavior of the plastic zone, obviously. And 
and then you need to characterize the shielding mechanism and the corrective drive force. Um, in the beginning, I told you the Paris law fails. This was not the whole truth. There are uh, other approaches to describe this overload behavior. So there's uh, you can in principle divide them by global analysis and cycle by cycle analysis. Uh, analysis. The global analysis, the Paris law obviously fails. The cycle by cycle analysis without interaction, which is the linear damage accumulation, is quite nice if you have um, if you have fatigue, which is dominated by break initiation. But if you have history defects and break growth then this linear damage accumulation case is where then we have so uh, we can already cut them out so this won't help us in describing the overload background behavior um, then you have several models that, that use the direction of cycles what we need to describe the history effects but the problem the problem of all these models the doesn't work. Okay, the problem of these models is that they need the physical input data. And if you think of the material behavior that I showed you two slides before, then it's not so easy to uh, get all this material behavior in the model. So uh, the need, you need experiments to describe this material behavior and to describe the local drive force. And this is what we do. We usually start with a notch that we um, fatigue under a constant amplitude force and wait until the crack initiate. I hope the beat is started. Oh, I have to click again. Sorry. No, the, the first the first image stands still for five seconds. So hopefully you see it now, the crack starting to grow. <laughs> no, the crack doesn't want to grow, which is nice. Oh, the crack does grow. So you see the crack grows. <laughs> okay. problem that if it doesn't work then I just skip it. Okay, okay I, I just skip it. You would see the crack grow and then we zoom in and we uh, 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 the, the technique we use to describe the crack that driving force is the digital image correlation. Um, now if you want to describe material behavior you start with the simplest case. You start with the material which doesn't show any strain out in behavior. And then, um, what you would have seen in the video, we would have let the crack grow until a certain point where we have put it into our scanning electron microscope with the small tensor tester. We open the crack, we uh, match the, the displacement fields with the um, digital image correlation, and we derive the strain fields out of this. Then we take the, um, the sample out of the SEM, uh, perform the overload, then let it fatigue again until it reaches its maximum reservation, and do this test again. To have, a, to have a look what does the plastic zone size. And what we expected at this point was that the plastic zone would decrease because the crack of the driving force decreases, because the crack became a lot slower and the plastic zone is somehow with the local information of how dangerous is the crack. And if you compare the size of the plastic zone and the amplitudes of the strain inside the plastic zone, you see a, a decrement uh, um, compared to position A to position B. But you see another thing. If you look at the orientation of the plastic zone, then before you see overload, you have, to have somehow a 45 degree orientation. After the overload, you, overload, you already have nearly a 90 degree orientation. So um, you already have a um, rotation of the plastic zone without strain hardening. We're not sure at this moment where this comes from, but the possible mechanism that we can imagine is uh, that the residual stress field works somehow as if the material would show strain hardening. And because the, the residual stress field in front of the crack uh, prevents the, the, the strain fields to evolve, and thereby the, the strain fields begin to rotate. Um, now to the driving force. In principle, you could use the plastic zone to describe exactly the driving force. The only problem is it's not that easy to measure, and it's not uniquely uh, measurement, because depending on where you measure the radius of the plastic zone, you will get another result. And especially if the plastic zones look like this, where you have some correlation artifacts, you will get problems. Another problem with the plastic zone is that we want to um, describe change of material behavior and 
have a yield strip change and the, the radius of the plastic zone would change and uh, you don't know where to measure. So we thought what else could we use? Well, the standard thing to use to describe corrective driving force is obviously the corrective open displacement. But the corrective force open displacement has a quite similar problem as the plastic zone because there are several positions where you can measure the corrective open displacement. And if you look, this is the corrective open displacement measured with digital image correlation as a function of the applied stress. And you see the crack begins to open gradually. But if you look here at the zero points, then the crack is closed uh, for, the, for the low stresses um, in, in this region. It just opens in, in, the, in, in the end, which is obvious because this is the effect of the system the spectral effect. So we thought, well, we have to look exactly at the crack, because as long as the crack is closed, the crack does not damage the material. And as, uh, as soon as the crack opens, it's directly proportional to the damage mechanism. So we zoomed in with the uh, field of view of this, not the whole image of maybe 10 by 10 uh, micrometer, and performed the digital image correlation with a pixel size of 10 nanometers. And um, now we are asking ourselves, where do you evaluate it? Because we have on the one side want to have the local information of the crack bit, but on the other side, we didn't want to have much scattering because of the crack part. Because if you look at the real crack, um, you, have, you always have some scattering because of the geometry. And we also want to do, obviously, the rare reliability ESC analysis, so we cannot increase the magnification up to infinity. Um, what we just do is we get high resolution measurements and we integrate the crack bit open space and behind the crack tip. And we found um, approximately one micrometer behind the crack tip to be quite constant regarding this happen, and we have all the locality we need um, for the local information. So that's nice, we have one practical driving force, but we wanted to have another one to have a redundant signal. And um, yes, the last driving force that is usually used in traction mechanics is the, the J integral. The J integral, um, the nice thing of the J integral is that it's completely independent of the form of the plastic zone. Um, it's just important that you integrate outside of the plastic zone, but we know quite well where the plastic zone is. So we can choose our path from the digital image correlation images the outside the plastic zone, and additionally, we can choose exactly the path where we know that the correlation has a high correlation coefficient, so we can reduce the correlation artifacts out of this. And um, starting from this, we just fit our DSC displacement um, mapping. We're cal calculating stresses and strains in the 2D system, we find the path, and then perform the integration using deltas. What do you mean by using deltas? Well, the J integral is not like KM. The delta J is not J max minus J min. In, in the delta j, the delta is in the arguments of the j, so it's a function of delta sigma, of delta epsilon, of delta t, and delta u. So the nice thing of digital image correlation is that you ultimately measure these delta because you always have a reference image and have a measurement image when you open the crack. So what we measure here um, automatically is the delta j that we need to describe our crack driving force. We also check for path independency and reproducibility by uh, comparing several cracks and found to be we found to be quite well. Now let's come to the results. Uh, the mean CTLT that I showed and the delta J approach that I showed in, in this graph. Um, you see at the beginning both remains nearly zero, which is quite logical because at this part of the opening cycle the crack is not open, the crack is closed. For the CTUD, it's quite obvious that it's, it's zero when the crack doesn't open, but why is the J, J zero? Well, as long as the crack is closed, you don't have a singularity. And then, by definition, the J must be zero. Well, from the starting point, the delta J and the CTUD begins to rise up, up to a maximum point. <coughs> and if you now compare this maximum point with the maximum point after the overload, you see a strong decrement, which is as well something we expected because Crack drive was needed to be reduced by um, the by the overload. Uh, another point that was quite interesting is when you look at the point where the crack began to open, you hardly see any changes before the overload and after the overload, but you see a strong change in the slope of the opening after the overload, which indicates that the plasticity induced crack closure is, is apparent in both cases, but it seems to be separated already before the overload, but the residual stress effect that reduces the corrective strain fields to evolve after the <coughs> overload uh, seems to be more dominant in this case. Well, with this, I want to conclude my talk. Um, uh, we wanted to show 
what do we need to describe material behavior regarding the overload effect that found it to be the corrective strain and the plastic zone behavior and the corrective driving force. And we showed that we can both see in the SEM digital image correlation by using um, just the plastic zone, the delta CQD, and the delta J, where we found small changes in the opening force, but big changes in the, in the slope, which indicates a strong dominance of the residual stress for this case. I would really have liked to show uh, the results of another material, but the problem was that our SEM was broken for two months. But here is my first result. This is the strength of a, a strong strain hardening material before the overload, and you already see that the plastic zone looks much different from the non hardening material. And this is my, my future work, what I'm going to do. I will check uh, for several materials, and will check that these mechanisms that, that are shown in the simulation will be, will be like this in, in uh, real materials as well. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.